Today's episode is brought to you by Blissey. Blissey offers silk pillowcases which give you better hair, better skin, and incredible sleep. This is a completely natural and hyperallergenic silk pillowcase designed by a team of experts that does wonders for your overall health while you sleep. I've had my Blissey pillowcase for about a month now, and I have to admit, it's so silky and comfortable and really has made sleeping a lot more relaxing especially with how its fabric stays so cool. I think my favorite thing about it is how Blissey really does well with regulating the temperature. Ever since getting Blissey, I'm definitely more refreshed in the mornings. And as you can see, even my dogs love Blissey. Blissey makes a perfect gift for any occasion. With the wedding season this summer, birthdays, or any other season, Blissey makes the most memorable gift because people use it every night and they think of you. Go to blissy.com slash southerncanny or just click the link below and you'll get an additional 30% off your order and free worldwide shipping. Get your energy back, sleep better, and even improve your hair and skin with Blissy Silk pillowcases. That's B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash southerncanny or just click the link below. Code automatically applied at checkout for an additional 30% off. Hi everyone, welcome back to a new video. I know you had to just sit through that sponsorship, but I wanted to give a trigger warning for story number one. Story number one contains some pretty graphic details about children, and if you don't want to hear any dark, gruesome stories like that, be sure to skip it. I'll have timestamps and a pinned comment down below. All that being said, let's get into the stories. I've had a number of things happen in my life. I'm now 70, which are really bizarre, weird, puzzling, or in a few cases, horrifying. This is one of the few that I feel I could share. The names used are the real names, except for one which is noted. Although there were no computers, or even microfiche databases then, police departments kept handwritten and typed files of crimes. And the one in Tennessee also kept newspaper clippings of the events with the files. This particular event may be found, I think. Although, it would take a lot of effort and perseverance in tracking things down that happened over six decades ago. While I was not quite ten, my parents took my best friend and I for a night at the West End Amusement Park called Kitty Land. It was a small park, having only about six rides, a pavilion with a snack bar, a small arcade, and a fun house, the Scream in the Dark. The autumn nights were perfect for a visit there. There were lights strung through the trees. There was almost always a mild warm breeze, carrying the smells of candy apples, cotton candy, popcorn, and the hot dogs and sauce that were the specialties. Most of the park guests were families, and it was a really safe place to bring the kids and grandkids for a few hours of relaxed, stress-free enjoyment. My friend Travis was really keen to go to the fun house. He had never been through it before. I had seen it when being constructed, since my father had a friend who actually helped with the planning for it. The building was of prefab corrugated metal, and there were tracks inside, made for the small cars which traveled through. The interior was really not large when you walked through it with lights on. It felt much bigger when riding in the cars, because the tracks looped back and forth, and never went more than 25 feet in a straight line. The floor was dirt, and on either side of the track were crudely animated low-tech figures of ghosts, witches, monsters, and such, all illuminated by colored lights, which were triggered as the cars approached so that the figures appeared suddenly out of the pitch-black darkness, jump scares, so to speak. There were also chains which would rattle as the cars passed, long loops of rubber hanging from above, which brushed over the passengers' faces in the dark, and in the corner of a small closet-like area where the tools were kept for the maintenance of the interior components. Yes, low-tech, but this was in the 1950s, so animatronics were many years from existing. So when Travis and I mounted the little cars and went through the creaking red wooden doors and into the darkness that night, I was already familiar with the layout, but he was both scared and delighted 
with every new flash of light and every new creature. The speaker system played hideous screams and howls to increase the effect, and the frequent jerky switchback of the tracks added to the disorientation. After only a few minutes, the ride was over, and our little car emerged from the exit doors and slowed to a stop. We went to join my parents who had been waiting for us, and then we all went to get 1950s-style junk food. But as we sat on a bench, enjoying the hot dogs and drinks, we were aware of something happening. There were screams, people yelling to get the police, people crowding and pressing together towards the fun house. We could see nothing but the backs of the crowd, and we thought someone must have been injured. My father went to go see if there was anything that he could help with, assuming that there had been someone hurt. He had some medical training from the military, and he pushed through the crowd. A few minutes passed. The two police officers who worked in their time off for park security ran past us, and shortly after, an ambulance pulled into the area by the funhouse, driving on the wide concrete walkways, which had been designed for fire or medical emergency vehicles. My mother Travis and I were worried and somewhat frightened, not knowing what was happening. My father came back and quietly told my mother to drive us home. He said he would have one of the police drive him home soon. He arrived home at almost midnight and he wouldn't tell me anything about what happened. Just an accident, he said. But later, I had heard him talking quietly to my mother in the kitchen, and the atmosphere in the house was still and heavy. When I went to bed, they were still sitting at the small kitchen table, drinking coffee silently and smoking. Yes, in those years almost everyone was a smoker. The rest of the story follows, which came from both local papers and an internal document from one of the detectives who handled the case. The one whom my father knew, and who was the father of another one of my friends named Sammy. When one of the little two passenger cars had emerged from the house, one child was sitting alone in the car, crying and hysterical. His younger brother had been pulled out of the car and then disappeared, screaming into the pitch black darkness. The older boy had no way to get out until the ride was over. The police had to shut down the entire park as they investigated, and they found no sign of the child. That is, until one of the officers thought to look into the tool maintenance closet. The child's body was crumpled and pushed into the back corner. His pants were on the floor. He had been killed by a stab wound to the heart and another to the throat, and his testicles had been removed. The dirt floor was soaked in congealing blood, but no weapon was found. The local police network with the county sheriff and they conducted a search for anyone who could have had access to the interior of the fun house, and very quickly learned that a young man, who I won't give fame by using his real name, but we'll call him Will, had been working in the park for several nights. He had also operated the fun house in the Ferris Wheel. He was a drifter who was hired for cash and hand labor as the park was being set up for the fall and winter season, and he had disappeared that night. It wasn't that hard to find a boarding house within walking distance of the park, and the police found that a man fitting his description had been there for a couple of weeks, but that he was not in his room that night. A search continued for two weeks more and brought no results. A number of drifters, hobos, and other transients had been stopped and interviewed, but this also was fruitless. The break in the case came a few weeks later, when a child had been abducted from an outdoor roller skating rink in the next state over in Tennessee. He had managed to escape from the man who had taken him to a room in a rundown boarding house, and the terrifying child had stopped a passing motorist who took him to the police station. Within an hour and a half, the police had three squad cars and two detectives, including the one from our own town, my friend's father, at the boarding house. They found the young man Will in his room, he made no resistance, but only laughed at anything he was asked. One of the officers beat him bloody with his fists before another pulled him off, but the man still laughed, even through bleeding lips and a broken nose. As they removed him, the two detectives searched the room for any clues as to a motive or any other related crimes. Well, in his closet, they found cheap work clothes bought from a thrift store. 
several pornographic magazines, and an old large suitcase. Inside the suitcase, they found the things which sickened even the hardened sensibilities of the longtime detectives. There were five mason jars, each containing a clear liquid and two testicles, child-sized, which had been removed from the scrotum, and trailing bloody thin strands floated in the liquid. There was a small wooden box with a simple latch on the lid, which contained a black handle, a number of children's teeth, locks of hair each wrapped in cellophane tape, and what was later found to be most of a tongue. None of the details of the condition of the funhouse victim or any of the details of the contents of the young man's suitcase were ever released to the public. In those days, forensic science was not in practice, and there was never any success in identifying the other victims, nor would the killer reveal where he had left the bodies. After a trial, which only lasted a few days, Will was found guilty of murder in the one case. There were no other bodies or plaintiffs for the other crimes, and he was sentenced to death in the gas chamber. He made no appeal of the verdict, and the only words that he spoke to anyone at all leading up to his death were curses. Although it was assumed that he had done these things as some sort of devil worship, he never gave any reason himself, and he only laughed when questioned. His death was recorded as required by law, and he was cremated in accordance with the local practice for unclaimed bodies. I really wish that I could give a happy ending to this story. I wish I could say that some closure was given to the other families of the other missing children. Sadly, sometimes in life there are no good answers to such cases. They serve only to remind us that the real-life monsters who walk amongst us are far more deadly than the creepypasta creations. And those monsters, whose motives are known only to themselves, could be standing in a line near you, or riding on a bus seated next to you, or just sitting across a room watching you and waiting the world is a pretty scary place it was a day like any other my cousins and i decided to go to a western theme amusement park near anaheim california to spend some time together as we're all on the cusp of adulthood and we haven't really been to an amusement park together since we were kids all was going well. It was hot, the lines were long, and after riding rides all day, our feet were killing us. We planned to stay until the park closed, so we were waiting at a roller coaster that faced towards the children's section of the park, while also planning where we would go next. During our planning and waiting in the long line, we heard three distinct pops. We assumed they were fireworks or general theme park noises, so my cousin's boyfriend made a joke that someone got popped. We thought nothing of it and continued to wait. All of a sudden, a large wave of people came running through the children's section of the park. I figured a ride that had been closed opened up and people were flocking to be first in line. But then, an even larger wave of people came after. I saw parents hiding their kids in the bushes where the rides were, ride operators rushing people off the rides they were on, and everyone around me asking, what the fuck's going on? That's when the most chilling words I've ever heard in my life came over the ride speakers. Get down, active shooter. We dug down and were absolutely terrified. My oldest cousin's boyfriend was crouching down and saying that we needed to get the fuck out of there. But considering the line we were in was elevated and faced directly where everyone was running from, we knew we couldn't stay there. After a minute of sitting there, a girl from above told us we need to get out of the line and leave. So we ran down the ramps of the line, passing by a crying lady holding her two kids crying, who looked me in the eyes and said through tears, this is not a drill. And that's when I knew I had to be serious. We ran to a wall and waited there while crouching. I was praying that me and my family could get out of there alive. My oldest cousin was calling her parents and there were children all around us who were just crying. We had to keep moving, so we got up and ran towards the back of the park to find the emergency exits. My cousin's boyfriend asked an employee where we could find one, but they didn't respond. They just stared at him blankly. 
We decided to follow a mob to the horse trails where the stagecoach goes around. We ran up a large ramp on the trail so we could get to the front of the park. Suddenly we were told to go back and get down. People were running back and we were all thrashed around until we all sat down on the floor. We saw the police outside the park and the lights of the park were turned off other than the decorative lighting. We were sitting ducks. If the shooter was in the park, we were out in a high open visible area. I called my mom and explained the situation, but all she could do was tell me to leave where I was. But she didn't understand that if I ran back or forward, I'd be right in the path of the shooter. I looked around to see hysterical people. A father was having a breakdown because his daughter wasn't with him. A girl was crying because she was alone with her little brother. And the one that got me the worst was a little boy who came to the park to celebrate his birthday, sobbing and telling me that he just wanted to see his daddy again. I tried to reassure him that he'll be alright and that he'll see his dad again, but to just stay quiet and behind us. My tall cousin let his sister wander off with her two friends while we went to ride the roller coaster and had no idea where she was, so he ran off by himself to go and try and look for her. We were just stuck up there for 10 or 20 minutes. My youngest cousin was crying, and her sister was going to start crying too after seeing her. She was just talking to her parents. Eventually, a group of people came up from behind us to cross the bridge. We followed them to the bottom of the ramp, to which we were met by an employee who informed us the shooting was a drive-by, and that we were safe to leave the park now. We walked out, all shaken up, and my mom told me that we should still be careful, as they could come back. Once we got to our car, we made sure our tall cousin was alright. He found his sister and her friends in a candy shop, hidden with a ton of crying kids. Once we got on the freeway, we were home free and can breathe. The whole experience was traumatic. While we may have not been in too much danger, not knowing where the shooter was, and the panic of all the people in the park combined left all of us hesitant to go to an amusement park for a while. This story is from when me and my college class were treated to a day out at Alton Towers. It was drawing to the end of the educational year, and the agriculture tutors booked the entire second year agricultural studies trip to the theme park. On the morning of the trip, a friend sat next to me on the bus right there, and we began talking about the alleged hauntings of the park. Now, I do believe in ghosts, but I've never experienced anything paranormal, so we just indulged ourselves on the topic to pass time. Plus, it kept us away from those who deemed us unworthy of conversation. When we got to Alton Towers, we had scanned our prepaid tickets and entered the park. After we did a few of the big rides, such as Rita, Oblivion, and Nemesis, we then headed over to the towers itself. The queue line was in the entrance to the actual castle, but the ride itself wasn't, and only disguised as if it was. People were talking amongst themselves, as were me and my friends. We were at the back of the queue, and that's when things started to get strange. I was bringing up the rear, so no one was behind me, we had come in the late spring, so temperatures were mild and comfortable. As I was standing talking to my friends, I felt as if I was being watched. I just shrugged it off and moved along with the line of people. It went cold, despite it being an average of 12 degrees Celsius, so I zipped up my hoodie. At this point, my friend Hannah looked at me. Steph, you're not seriously cold, are you? she asked. Hannah had her hoodie tied around her waist and was looking at me as if I had gone mad. You don't feel cold? I asked. Hannah and my other friend Grace just shook their heads. I calmed down a bit when they told me I was being stupid. Then it all came to a head. As I was just about to calm down, I then felt someone breathing in my left ear. It felt and sounded angry, pissed off even. Now, I'm spiritual myself, and I even consider myself pagan, but this made me turn ice cold. Get out, witch! 
A male shouted down my ear, causing me to scream and bolt out of the building. Hannah and Grace followed me, seeing me sitting on the steps to the entrance in tears. Steph, what happened? Grace asked, when she then sat down next to me. I heard a man's voice screaming at me to get out. I'm not going back in there, ever again. I told my friends. It was from that day forward that I realized I was sensitive to spiritual presences, and I've not gone into that building since. I don't like going into places that have negative energy. So next time you guys queue up for Hex, be on guard for the Earl of Shrewsbury. He doesn't take kindly to those who have spiritual gifts.